committee meeting to order. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming to speak with us this afternoon. Just a quick time check. A number of us are going to be heading to Annapolis this afternoon uh, with the folks from MCEA. So we're going to try to limit this session to about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but I think that we should be able to get through it uh, and ask a number of questions. But um, I'm very familiar with your work generally. Um, would love to look forward to getting an update. And I'm so happy that you guys are here this afternoon. Ms. McMillan, is there anything that you'd like to mention as we get started? I just um, want to say I think this is a really interesting initiative because it, it, it's, it's government participation but not government driven. Yes. And I know, you know Mr. Rice has been obviously really involved with this in his area, but it's a very it's, it's a really interesting model to look at, and it's very outcome driven. Um, and so you'll have a presentation today, which I think will just sort of lead you into a lot of good questions. But other than that, I don't have anything else to Great. mention at this time. I appreciate that. And I'll add it, it's in a part of our community that, that desperately needs more support uh, and more infrastructure. And so for that reason also, I'm very excited about your work. But why don't we turn over to you guys to go ahead and walk us through the presentation and then we'll ask questions as you go through if that's okay. Mm -hmm. We would love that. We welcome the questions because there is um, a lot of complexities, especially with the different funding streams and, and how it all kind of comes together. Um, so this is really about changing an ecosystem. And so we're- You just introduce yourself for oh. the record too. That would be great. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm Crystal Townsend. I'm president and CEO of the Healthcare Initiative Foundation. Great. Thanks, Crystal. Hi, and I'm Kylie McLeaf, the executive at Family Services. Great. Thank you. All right. So. Thriving Germantown is about really changing the ecosystem of a community. And so we're really looking at another means of rephrasing the word health in all policies, okay? So this is about how we're connecting all the resources for a community so that they're accessible to families and whole households. So it's really transitioning from product to project to over community to community. Okay, and so um, on the next slide we have um, recently the Healthcare Initiative Foundation helped sponsor a report that was done by the Council of Governments called Uneven Opportunities, and we actually funded the part which shows uneven opportunities in Montgomery County by life expectancy. And so you can see some of the trend data of where um, we need to begin to focus. So. We really have utilized the data to have, try to drive where our interventions are happening. And when you go to the next slide, this actually breaks it down by census tract, so you can actually see the differential just by census tract and community. And of course, the area that we're targeting is where there is a higher um, need for intervention. So we started uh, focusing on Germantown um, Many of you probably have heard this story, but I had a trustee that stated that I needed to go visit um, Daly Elementary School and to meet with the principal there that was doing amazing work. And the principal is Nora Dietz, and I met with her, and, and I really didn't know what the fit of our foundation would be. Um, we are healthcare, and we mostly, prior to that, did workforce and safety net clinics. And she really changed and helped me uh, rethink um, when she was saying things like, you know, my, my children are hungry and my children can't see to read. So we started piloting a couple interventions there and we also started a discovery of about a year and a half working with nonprofits, government sector, Department of Health and Human Services, um, of course, um, Mr. Rice, thank you, Councilmember Rice, for your support. And we had about, uh, I would say 20 meetings with the community over a year and a half, and we developed a concept paper called Thrive in Germantown and had over 100 readers of that paper and that work. And in that process, um, that's how we developed the design for the project. Um, but these are some of the indicators on this slide of why we decided to focus in on this community in, in Germantown. And what came out of that process and, and meeting, we had family dinner meetings at the school. We did outreach to the school. We actually worked with Department of Health and Human Services, um, Louise Cardona, to actually do tours with, um, within the neighborhood and talk with families to see what they wanted, what they were missing. And um, 
from there they said that they wanted to have the resources at the school where they felt safe. So instead of doing the intervention directly in the mobile home park, we focused in at the school. Right, we're a place where, where they're coming where they feel safe. So we were looking at a, a couple different um, modalities. One is we knew that there was, when there's a community that doesn't have a lot of resources there, right? You, you have to be bringing resources to the community as well as helping families identify and navigate the system. So we found a Community Hub Pathways model, which is a platform that does a universal assessment and then enables you to develop pathways for families to go into. And then, um, of from those pathways you get like a risk score so you're actually seeing how you through intensive case management can reduce the risk of a family for sustainability and building their resilience and so we um, picked the community hub pathways model to do that work and then we also picked another model clear impact scorecard which helps integrate the data of the providers so as the case managers are identifying needs they're actually referring those services to nonprofit partners that we have in the community. And we have eight MOU partners, but we have about 20 partners in this partnership already. You know, and big examples I give with this is that if you look at food, and if you look at the whole household's food needs, you're, you're trying to help the family navigate how they can manage MANA food services, the snack back program through Winter, Women of Care Ministries is at that school, SNAP ENT, food stamps, and Germantown Health Emergency Assistance, because it takes all of those resources to meet the food security need. It's not one of those initiatives. So helping families do that, so we're not taking it just by individual by individual, but household by household. Then we also looked at the Promise Neighborhoods model, which was uh, an overall collective impact model, and that's where we really honed in on this that we needed to be looking at you know, from zero um, to college and career pathways and really looking at the whole household sustainability. Then we wanted to make sure that as we were moving this cruise ship that we're moving it all in the right direction. So we made sure that we were aligning with the priorities of Healthy Montgomery, Nexus Montgomery, the Institute of Public Health Innovations, um, Trinity Community Health Transformation Grants, which is bringing $250,000 into the community each year. MCS is priority to work on the disparities between academic achievement, working with the Tr Children's Opportunity Fund, Montgomery Moving Forward, Department of Health and Human Services work around um, two generational poverty, and also working on improving race equity in our community. So we aim big. Um, we also had some really core um, tenets to our work is that place matters in our in our initiative and that it is everything that surrounds the environment uh, that will ensure that our uh, families are able to to thrive and so we needed to look at the whole ecosystem and not just service level by service level and that we also wanted to make sure that we were helping to address some of the trauma that is happening in our community and that we needed to ensure that we had safe and stable nurturing relationships, not even just in the household, but within the school. And then um, we also, this leads into our, our third tenet, which is around the physical health and mental health of learning and brain functioning. So all those core pieces, you know, food, safety of the home, um, preparation for early learning, um, vision, healthcare, behavioral health services all bring into that elements. So we created a, uh, a, a very um, systemic approach that focuses on health, social services, education, and uses a multi-sector, multi-generational place-based approach. We have our integrated care coordination that focuses on early care and education, health and wellness, <coughs> behavioral health, and household stabilization which is workforce, emergency assistance, and resources such as uh, eviction prevention, um, you know, helping with utilities and things like that. We also wanted to integrate a trauma-informed practice, so all the, the staff 
through the Family Services through our Germantown Hub are utilizing a trauma-informed practice, but we also started working in the school and working with the teachers and administration, and we have some amazing stories that have come out of that intervention, but I'll let Kylie tell them more about that. And then we wanted to make sure we were measuring our work at, of this collective impact model. So that's where we're using the Community Health Pathway Connect and our Clear Impact Scorecard. So our three goals are to assure safe and stable nurturing um, relations of environments for um, daily elementary school children in the pilot, improve academic achievement for students attending daily elementary school, and improve health outcomes for children and families. We launched the project just over a year ago, December 2017, with the goal of serving 150 students in the first year and adding additional 90 um, in subsequent years. And as of today, we've served 255. Yeah, every intervention that we provide at the school and for the community, it, it fills up immediately. And we'll go into some of those a little bit. The next is the, um, is this the oh, sorry. that's okay, is the TG um, Pathways Hub Connect Collective Impact Funding Model. And that really shows you what investors are going into helping to support each pathway. You know, how, how philanthropy typically works, we fund in our, by our mission. And so we had to help uh, the funding community see how they could all align even to this work, even if they weren't funding household stabilization, they were funding early care, but how all these goal, how all these initiatives in totality will be improving the overall um, ability for our families to thrive. So we have um, a pathway for early care education that has a whole resources of funders supporting that effort, health and wellness, behavioral health and household stabilization. And I will tell you, when we have the partner meeting and all of these people are sitting in um, to hear about the outcomes, it's a point in time for funders to actually see how their funding is building on other funding, um, which has been very different for a lot of our service delivery. Yeah. And it's also helping the nonprofits see how their work is supporting other nonprofits, right? So it, it's it's a mutually reinforcing piece. The next uh, slide, we'll get through this one. It it really goes through and shows you the goals, and then it lines the partners that are helping to support each of those goals, and then it talks about the outcomes that are for each one of the to measure for each of these goals. And I'm sorry for the small print. Um, <laughs> Try but, to uh, yes, but the. The really interesting piece about this is that it helps show who is responsible for driving and making change for, to meet these goals. And so they've all committed to provide their data for these areas. Um, they don't have to provide data for everything. They only have to provide the data that they are actually impacting. But, they're, but in, in collective totality now, they're able to see how all these resources that are coming to the community can make improvements under these goals. The next um, slide shows you kind of the hub and the areas of focus. So we have how we design this because each one of these systems is very complex, as you know. Um, we wanted to make sure that as we were hiring staff that they had an expertise in each one of these areas. So while they are doing case management for the whole household, there's somebody that's on the team that specializes in behavioral health early care um, education, housing stabilization, and health and wellness to provide expertise. And then the next slide, um, we have it color-coded to show um, red indicates uh, a project that was funded by HIF to bring resources to the up-county region. Because as I previously stated, if we just did the case management and didn't have the resources to refer the families to, that would not be helpful and we would not have be able to have outcomes. So we um, made huge investments um, in bringing and helping to bring resources <coughs> to the up county region and specifically Germantown. And the other piece is, is that this also helped a lot of our nonprofits that already had in their strategic plan to begin moving services but just didn't have the resources to get services there. And then in blue indicates the funders that are helping to support this work. And then uh, green is other collaborative partners that have been helping with the design and helping with um, 
specifically with the outcome measures as well and the reading and support. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so since this slide, actually, I met with Angela this morning, who is the um, program director, and he said, no, it's actually 255 as of today. Um, of that, 50% of those have what's called a social service pathway um, that's being completed either through connection through resources or um, them connecting to other nonprofits that provide that. So the interesting thing, when you have a hub, the true hub that is done in different states, it's normally a larger provider, I should say, or a health and human service that is the true hub that then all these other service providers feed into. But since we started with a small pilot, we're doing a little bit of both, means we're the hub so we connect all the other nonprofits as well as doing the care coordination in the homes. Um, so 168 needed connections to social health, behavioral health workforce. Um, we're declining risk by 82%. So when you go in and you look at the risk scores, you can see how that declines after the pathways are closed. Um, this one's interesting. So I asked the completion rate for, for health. Why does it take so long to close that? Well, in that risk score is to close a behavioral health, and many of them are referred out to behavioral health services. You can't close that pathway until they have three appointments. Mm -hmm. That could take months. Um, so that helped clarify those numbers for me because I thought, well, that's kind of low, but it does make sense. Um, some of the partnerships that we have, when we talked about food assistance, MANA, Women Who Cares, um, Germantown Help, these are all, you know, the nonprofits that are funding in or funneling in their data for us. Um, ESOL classes are offered through McHale. Um, we're also doing Dare to Be You for substance use and prevention with the families. Um, and we talked a little about the trauma training. So family services a few years ago went through the National Council to set up a trauma-informed approach through our whole organization. Now we're working with Daily and training them on what that approach looks like, especially secondary trauma for teachers, for providers that are there, um, reintegration, things like that. So that's been a lot of self-care work for them as well as our own staff. One of the biggest pieces with a trauma-informed approach is really helping, it's not expecting our teachers or admin to be behavioral health specialists, but it's asking them to reframe the questions. Instead of looking at saying, what's wrong with you? Saying, what happened? What led up to this? So it's a reframing of how their approach is and helping them understand how trauma might manifest itself in behaviors in the classroom. So if somebody is unable to stay still or has, is triggered by loud noises, and understanding what that looks like so that they can appropriately identify what the real circumstances are going on. So I just want to be clear that it's not an expect, we're not expecting more of the teachers, we're just giving them tools, tools. to better understand and have, have that understanding of how trauma, what trauma looks like. Um, we've established formal and I will say some informal agreements um, with providers. Uh, many of those have signed an MOU. You can see the organizations Aspire, Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, Every Mind, Germantown Help, Identity, uh, Man of Food, Primary Care Coalition, and Women Who Care Ministries. And then we do have some, as I said, some other programming that's happening. And again, they're sharing data with us. Um, we have been expanding organically into other schools, not through referral, but as we provide trainings or um, things in the community, we're now connecting with Germantown Elementary in Nielsville. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Clapper Mill Clapper Elementary. Mill Elementary. Yeah. yeah. Um, most recently, last year, we received the million dollar bond bill. Um, thank you to Senator Nancy King and Delegate Resnick. We have been all over the map trying to find a location in Germantown. It's not as easy as one would think. Um, Council Member Rice actually joined us on a tour of a wonderful location and he just increased the cost. Um, so it's the million dollars only gets you so far. Um, and then we additionally had the Montgomery County Council put 100000 this year into this current year's budget um, to 
assist us with mostly for this location, what would it take to have egress? What would it take for handicap accessibility? Um, we would have had to put a tremendous amount of money in just for an elevator. It's four floors. Um, so we continue to look for that. How many um, square feet are you looking for? We have 11 nonprofits that want to mm -hmm. co-locate um, up county. And ideally, what they have suggested is 11,000 square feet. We probably will not be able to get right. that full amount. Um, a lot of the capacity piece is around, you know, just helping with co-storage. So if we have four food providers helping build out that co-storage for four food providers. You know, it makes sense. We don't want to have four food providers all have their individual storage. So just all those pieces. So some of that is some of the space needs. And storage is, um, if you have it, depending on the space, it could be costly to have storage when you can't bill for rent for all that. So, right. so yes, it's, it's a complex, um, but we'll, we'll work it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the the last location actually was perfect it was a residential home part of it commercial part of it residential so it just had a feel to it when you pulled up that felt very welcoming as as opposed to a stark office building um so we'll see we'll go back to negotiations on that but to have 11 nonprofits, i mean if you've been to the gerard place where family services at least our executive office is located with 15 other nonprofits, so somebody gets off the bus and they could have taking them an hour to get there they can go to CCI community help they can go to family services to go to the clinic they can go to Yuma and they can go to foreclosure they can I mean a plethora of help right there um, so it does make for ease for those that's seeking need Councilmember Glass I think you alluded to this a little bit but can you explain um, business model is the only word that that I can use to ask for more information uh, is it a village type uh, setting that you're trying to create a one-stop shop you mean with the space yeah yes so I better understand what so yeah it would be okay. more like an up county nonprofit space great um, and you're looking to rent out I'm just trying to figure out what some of the funding goes towards and if the nonprofits rent whatever rent square back. foot yet yeah, rent a back. very low rate um, okay yeah and and the beauty is, is that we're, you know, one of the features we're looking at is having some hoteling options. So we have a lot of um, nonprofits that are doing work in the schools, but they might have floater staff. They're going to several schools and they need a place just to pop in for, you know, a couple of hours, do some paperwork and pop back out. So they might not technically need a full office, but giving people space to go into like Crittenden Family Services, identity, you know, to be able to pop in staff so they can have a place to, to locate and do their work. We're also looking at um, allowing opportunities for, you know, just popping in, having an office so you can reserve to have after hours behavioral health services um, so that somebody doesn't have to have a full on office there, but can, can basically hotel it. How long have you been looking for this location, a location? July 1st okay and we've toured four locations so far one of which was on Middlebrook which was a great location yeah. except it was on the second floor so when you're trying to haul up food it's it's not the best scenario yeah th th this is the eternal quest that so many nonprofits uh, begin yeah. in trying to do better by the community and trying to find space I've been there. I know we've all assisted or been part of that process. So, yeah. okay. Keep us posted. Keep me posted. Yeah. Um, Hathway or the Pathways Hub Connect, the platform, which I, for some, it's easier for me just because of the background that I think of it as the electronic health record for our families. Mm -hmm. It is the hub. It's called the hub platform, but it truly gathers all of the data per family and it is connected to crisp um, which is helpful when you're looking at health indicators and, and outcomes can you just say what crisp is for people yes it's the chesapeake regional information system so basically you know going back to supporting the work of like nexus montgomery we want to make sure in the hospitals that we were that helped develop the outcomes for this model really wanted to show that we're working on this um, emergency room and the return and so that's why this data is so important. And it's also important to 
the family support coordinators to know if there was an intervention at the hospital and how they can help support the family. And if we have families that were using the hospital as their primary care, knowing that we need to better connect them to their primary care and not use that as their health home, um, or if there's a continual readmittance, the hospital is going to want support around that. Um, so it, again, another great connection for us in, in some of the hospitals. Um, HHS also was awarded the multi-year ecosystem grant from the Kresge Foundation. Um, so we've been working with them around the support for East County um, and thriving Germantown to develop a strategic partnership. What does this look like in Germantown? What can we do that is very similar in East County to build off the success that we've found? Um, also around local leadership, common goals and outcomes. So this is a little snapshot of the scorecard, and I will tell you the scorecard is about five pages long. So on the next two slides you'll have is just a snapshot of what we consider care coordination and access to care, but there's also um, vision care data that we're collecting, behavioral health, promoting academic achievement, and then the um, safe, stable, and nurturing environments for children. And within that, what we wanted to, the hard part a little bit around this and the data is, one, there was no baseline. There wasn't anything for us to start from, so really our data the first year is build up, um, you know, so there's a little, there's a lack at the very beginning of how you get, you know, everybody enrolled. Um, but what we see is a constant trend up on most things. You know, and some things are gonna go down because once you've completed a pathway until you enroll a new family, you're not gonna have, a, you know, another intervention. But when it, you look at how many, so for us, for a checklist, every time you go in and you deal with the family, so far we've done 1,932 checks between 916 adults and 1,016 kids. Um, so that's a tremendous amount of work for four staff. Yep. <laughs> Um, and on the second slide, um, you know, this is access to care. So within, you know, and this is capturing within those zip codes, all of the families that we're providing care to and all of who we're making the connections with and they're providing the, the data back to our data person to drop in this. So it's not just our data. It truly is the community's impact of the nonprofits that are providing that information. So we think of it like a Venn diagram. We have the daily school data, and then we actually have the data by two, we're collecting by two zip codes, 20876 and 20874. And with that, we've been able to really see which zip code is actually utilizing more services. And in some ways, we found that it was, it was counterintuitive to what we had assumed where the need would be. So we actually pulled the food providers together and asked how we could begin doing more outreach to that zip code because that's where the, the hard data in the community is saying the need is, but we seem to have the people we're accessing in one zip code. So we're using this data already to change how we're delivering services and, help, and using the data to help the providers to know as well. Okay, okay. so um, the vision moving forward um, is that we're, we're really, um, we would like this to continue to build the, um, the governance structure within the community. So this it would be a community program. Um, we have a thriving Durbantown Advisory Committee. We've also helped um, support IPHI's work and do public health innovation work to help support the school wellness councils, which is building um, leadership within local schools. And then the PTAs. And then um, we're also between the nonprofits and funders. And then um, we believe that community decision making helps us improve our equity, inclusion, and our diversity goals. And then that we are not telling the community what they need, but the community is helping to drive what they need as well. But we're able to use our data analytics to help see where services are being requested and needed and make changes and pivot as we go along and help provide that data to the community so they can help make decisions. Um, you know, we continue wanting to add on new partners to the Clear Impact onto the Clear Impact Scorecard for data sharing, continuing the trauma informed practices and work, and including race equity in that work as well. 
and then also um, looking at continuing to support funding, community funding allocations. Um, last week, HIF held a training for all of its nonprofits on, on race equity inclusion, and we had um, over 100 attendees and about 60 nonprofits attend. And the latter part of the day was focused on how they can begin to apply a race equity lens to their work. So we're already starting that, building that capacity within our nonprofit community. So collective impact and leveraging the investment. So I know that's really, really small. Um, <laughs> Should have blown it up as big as possible. Yes, um, I can provide another graphic yeah. of that later to you all. Um, but what it is, it's like really taking in that, that map earlier where we showed all the uneven opportunities in our community and then I, was building on the work that was done by Dr. Gale as our public health officer that focused on the 10 zip codes that um, were, were showing some um, distress and need, need for investment. And then so we started looking at how we could begin to build up some interoperability between what we're starting in the hub and build the capacity of these other nonprofits. So we've already started our first launch into this was, you know, working with the Kresge Foundation Funds and the Department of Health and Human Services, how to develop common goals similar to what we have in Thriving Jump in East County. And then we've also started in Tacoma Park and Long Branch, giving cheer three seats on the platform. We've already invested with them as food as medicine project. So they already have eight partners and MOUs already established. So we already have the benchmarks there. Then we started looking at what were opportunities to, through what's called a health bridge, which I'll go into in a little bit later, how we can connect on the neighborhood opportunity networks with to the system. So we're able, what the health bridge does, it allows you electronically to be able to refer to a partner and get that data back. So connecting them, and then, you know, how we can identify other um, connector entities. Um, each one of these top 10 zip codes would be the goal in using the system. Yeah, and you know, when we look at, at least in my small world of what are we already doing that we can connect on, you know, we're in 12 different linkages sites, right? So in the hub, we're not actually the true service provider, we're the, we're the connector and driving the data. Um, but we also do linkages, so how can we connect the linkages in to also continue to drive data and to get referrals in and out so you can truly track to know mm -hmm. yes I did this referral but you'll never know unless you connect back to that provider or the family members um, provide that information back to you and the families that we're providing and linkages are not the easiest to get information back from um, so if there's an easier way to ensure um, these connections are made and we can check that off why not the other piece of, in my my dream of all dreams, right? So I would love to create anchor business institutions with each of these, connected with each of these zip codes too. Um, one of the areas that we are finding as a gap is, is workforce um, and that our traditional systems for helping people get into the workforce um, don't always work in the, with the individuals we're serving. So we need to find unique creative solutions for that and how we can build upon systems like with LD, LEDC, life assets for the micro business loans to create their own businesses and build their own wealth with these communities, but have those industries help support other anchor industries. Sort of like the convergence model that was done in Ohio, where you had a hospital connecting to a, co a cooperative dry cleaners made from the community and the dry cleaners helped provide all of the servicing for the hospital. So being really creative how we can drive, we're looking at potentially with early care and education, creating a cooperative with that. And so it could help drive some service industries that are huge in our community. You know, we see signs for um, late night childcare and they could maybe do the childcare for shift working for the hospital industry and things like that. So just, we need to be creative as, as how we're servicing these communities and especially with the workforce area. And when we talk about early care, the other thing that was a push is, you know, what about a safe and nurturing environment for the kids? We know a lot of those kids are in that mobile home park during the day while the other kids are at the elementary school. 
there's no way licensing is ever going to license a provider there without the playgrounds or you know the pieces that need to be in place but how can we go in and train those family members around SIDS, CPR and first aid? You know, you might not have to hit every piece, but you are gonna make it safe for them, even um, parenting classes, but also early child care. You know, what can you do for the grandma that has six of the kids there? We know what happens. You know, we're in the homes, we know, but what can we do that are, is our core competency to go in and train? Um, so we have been working with Holy Cross Hospital on some of those pieces. And big things that Angelo has pushed, who's the program manager, is that every family has a library card. And he's done, like, trips to the library um, to access their early learning kits, too. So they're just helping better connect families to resources that are already there um, so that we can help really focus in on that early learning um, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the new pieces that we're going to be launching in July is how to connect our health record to a referral source that can connect to anything in the county. Um, so HealthBridge is actually also part of the software that also does our hub pathway model. So when you look at this, it is a, it's a public website. It's being used right now um, for a health department in um, Seattle. Mm -hmm. Um, Chris and I are hoping to go out and actually take a look at it, but it is an integrated, so it's a little better if you go to the next slide. As the community hub, this referral source can connect anybody that wants to put their information on here and be a connected resource. So we're functioning as the hub, but we're also functioning as a care coordinator. But this can connect hospitals, the public can have access to this. It's it's a um, portal that's on the web it's free um, community-based organizations but again it gets back to how do we know once we've made that referral that that connection has been made I don't have to have their private health information I just need to know yes the appointment was made you know and yes that connection and check that off the list as a care coordinator um, but then the same for a hospital they could be referring back to us as a as the provider as you can see around this circle it's a whole slew and we've been talking a little bit to um, health and human services this we could dump 311 into this we could dump info montgomery into this that that's where i was going to go uh, how do how to expand that concept or where, what other departments or agencies are using it or could potentially benefit from it yeah and the other um, amazing piece is that it's it's not the responsibility of the nonprofit to populate necessarily um, it gets populated by somebody making the referral. So just when I was uh, working with them on the demo, just from the hub referrals, they were able to populate, and I could see how many times successfully a family went to this agency or did this just by seeing it just populates on a GM map. So you, it's just so informative in its practice. So I think one of the challenges that we have with um, some other um, systems in place is that information changes um, we are a very dynamic society and static information does not um, help in the service delivery model so having something that that allows you to be dy dynamic and current um, is, is mm -hmm. where we see we need to go and you can search by what service you're looking for what zip code you're looking for and it just populates it on a map um, and pinpoints it for you and then the direct connect for a referral um, which makes it easy for anyone that's using that and is that a platform that you are building out or you said it it, it is already so it's online being built out um, it's being used in other communities um, we would like to start at July 1st actually we received um, the CHRC we just received word on Friday um, and it's built into that budget um, so we would start connecting July 1st and would that be proprietary to you just trying to figure out how it can be expanded okay yep. great yep. i mean there is a cost to expand i understood <laughs> right 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 well for, first is ability to get access yes. to it and if the answer to that is yes then it's then it's the money right okay so um you know our, our next phase is you know we've already um, spoken to some of this about how we could you know, with the Kresge Foundation funding and, and the partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services, um, coordinate on how we could begin um, bringing to scale in other communities, um, how we can work on, you know, bringing to 
this interoperability through the health bridges, expand linkages with the non neighborhood opportunity network and linkages to learning. Um, we're already connecting with the Food as Medicine Project um, in Tacoma Park and Long Branch, um, but we would like to see um, how we could potentially add additional funders to help support and expand that work. Um, one thing that we think would be interesting is if, along with that zip code, the 10 zip code map, if we could look at um, how our council grants and county executive grants are, I know it's one system now, but how we could look how that funding is helping to hit those 10 zip codes because that are being underinvested in. And I don't, I don't have a solution for that, but I just wanted to point, I think that would be a real interest. If we know these are the communities in need, how we can help really direct investment in those areas. Um, and then continue to explore partnerships with Nexus Montgomery, especially as we, um, we are now connected with Chris, but how we can help be some of that case management uh, for um, their discharge patients to help, help, help with overall wellness. And then um, explore, as I mentioned, this anchor business opportunity so that we can begin to be creative on how we're um, providing workforce needs. Great presentation. Um, I have lots of thoughts and questions. I will defer to my colleague, Councilmember Rice, who I know uh, was his leadership helped us get where we are today. So um, I'll defer to him to make some initial comments and ask questions, and then I'll follow up after that. Well, I don't really have any questions, I'd, and I'm, I'm going to be brief in terms of my comments. Let me just first thank the two of you, uh, and especially Crystal. Uh, you know how much I think of you in terms of this space. You do such a phenomenal job of always being intentional about how we can make our system better uh, for those who need it most, and this is a, a prime example of that. I'll remind folks that our linkages to learning uh, sites that we are so proud of that we see uh, throughout the county. We only have one in the Germantown area, and that's at Fox Chapel, and that's as far north as it goes. And so really trying to fill that void, understanding that those linkages sites provide that first step of that hub model uh, to many of our communities that need it is part of the impetus. Uh, and then when you think about other schools like Nielsville and Watkins Mill and uh, the challenges that some of those schools face in terms of providing. It's a reason why they have a health and wellness center at uh, Watkins Mill. It's, it's really designed to try and bring all of that together, but understanding that under the concentration of Germantown that has 100,000 residents, a significantly large portion of those residents are of need. And so it really was something, and because Germantown also is uniquely positioned, in that it doesn't have the same robust access to uh, transit as some of the other communities do, it just further exacerbates a lot of the challenges and the disparities that we see, especially when it comes to health uh, access. And so from that perspective, that's why this model is so important uh, and why it needs to be done in a place like Germantown, whereas you may be able to get away with doing something else differently and structuring it differently in other parts of the county. Uh, so it really was a lot of work uh, and thought that came into how best trying to utilize what we had done before in some of our models, but understanding that that just doesn't work because we're not situated the same kind of way. And our, and our, the reality is, is that even those pockets of where uh, that need are, are spread out throughout Germantown. They're not in one area, uh, which is good from a planning perspective because we don't have a high concentration only in one area of Germantown, but it's also bad when it comes to trying to provide access uh, and services for all of those folks. So I just wanted to give a little bit of the baseline of uh, why it is that this model is so important here uh, and why I think it will work so well as well uh, because it brings all of those things together. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm thrilled that this is going on. Uh, I remember when I first started with the county, I went to the ICB board meeting that included representatives of Montgomery College, of the chief administrative officer, uh, the president of the council at the time, the superintendent, and I thought, God, we should just shut the room, the door to the room, and just figure this out. You know, I mean, I think we could close the achievement gap if we just had these decision makers together 
um, and, and instead we were talking about space at BCC. So I, I think that um, convening a time and space for organizations to convene and gather uh, is so important. I see Dr. Bryce and Dr. Barnes from Health and Human Services and MCPS in the audience because obviously they are important players here as well. Um, and I think the, the collection of services like this, and I can see why Ms. McMillan is excited about this particular venture, because uh, this is something that can and should be replicated across the entire county. Um, I want to go to the funding uh, component. So the county next year will be revamping the manner in which we conduct our grants. There was a consolidation on the front end in the way of an application this year, but on the back end, the council has its process and the executive has his process, and that will be consolidated. I think as a matter of practice, we should be looking at trying to solve issues because they are very unique to geographic locations, but that we consult with you guys um, as we make decisions because you have access to data on a macro level and can connect dots that, and do it much more efficiently than we can here. Uh, and, and you're out in the community every day and can see and feel that need. So I think as a matter of practice next year, um, as we're looking at different consultants and bringing, or when I say consultants, I mean residents from the community who volunteer their time to serve on the committee, um, I think efforts like this that bring so many different bodies together should be consulted as well. Um, and I think that could, that could certainly be established as a best practice. Um, you mentioned workforce development. Uh, we um, had an um, interesting session with Workforce Montgomery last week uh, in which it, it's very clear that this is an area that um, will require a little bit more investment and they are heading in a different directions in terms of their practices. Um, but could you elaborate a little bit more on what you're seeing from a workforce development standpoint and how or if you interact with WorkSource currently uh, and, and what could be done to improve in that space from your perspective? So it's interesting, we talked about this just when I got here, um, is part of the issue for us, for many of the families there, is they're undocumented. So they can't utilize WorkSource. So we've been trying to do an untraditional type of, well, can we bring training or something else at least to them to utilize? So that has been a big barrier for us um, around workforce. Um, and that's where I've been trying to think of uh, build on more creative solutions. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, and this, when we talk about moving this and bringing this to scale in other communities, it will be unique to each community too. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a unique s solution for each community. Um, so that's where we're, th we're thinking if we could look at how to utilize, you guys made a huge investment in microenterprise um, loans and um, so one of the pieces once we have a place for in this nonprofit hub sector we want to have a classroom space and we want to bring ledc life assets there to help start doing some of this work but we want to make sure we are helping take to the next step how will that line of business help support an anchor institution so that business can be secure so that's where that convergence model comes in it's also um, been called the democracy collaborative too so it's a way of helping individuals connect with a larger business, but still building their own wealth through their business. And um, it's a great model that has worked in other communities. And I think if we align resources that are already allocated strategically, we can meet the same goal. Great, um, that's really helpful. And how are the 255 students selected? How how is how is the I, I, you had mentioned but if you could elaborate on that a little bit how how does the referral process work? Yeah, so um, we're again we're doing a trauma informed approach. Right. So this is a, a service that's accessible to any family in that community. So we did not want to take it from a, a deficit model that again trying to get away from you're selected for this program because you're in need, but rather that every you might have different needs at different times and that every family needs support or has questions or might need a referral for resources or information. So we try to take a very uh, strength-based approach to this. So 
it's anybody in that school community that is interested in the service. And most of it, honestly, when the first 25 families enrolled, it was mostly by word of mouth within the community. Mm -hmm. um, they would hand them the flyer and say, well, yes, this is who I'm working with. And it was family to family, the large majority. Um, and just one, two, two last comments. Um, I think that it's wonderful that we're doing a great job connecting our service providers and the various sectors that are out there. I think the next phase of this work moving forward is connecting com connecting families that, that are receiving services. One of the things I've observed uh, in going out is because families are working for so many hours, um, they feel very much alone and on an island and they don't reach out socially or develop a, um, a network to get support within their communities apart from just the service providers who oftentimes have regular business hours and oftentimes are doing phenomenal work, but it's those organic relationships that I think will help build communities. And so I know Identity is starting to do a lot of great work in this space by connecting the parents of children that are in their programs um, more intentionally. Um, and I think that moving forward, that as a next phase of this important work um, will help strengthen the safety net even further. Um, so just just a comment. Mm -hmm. no, we, we totally um, support that. In fact, that's why we started the, the advisory committee made yeah. up of the families in the school that are actually kind of designing where they're going. Like they choose to go to the aquarium or they're, they're choosing what they're doing as family activities yeah. together. Um, in addition, um, one really amazing piece that just happened with Identity is that they actually have had both Clopper Mill Elementary School parents and Daly Elementary School parents meet together in doing mm -hmm. some of this uh, parental work together. So it's actually connecting two communities together. So it's been some really a beautiful piece to see. But I think what the next level we want to get to is some of the giving those members that are attending those parents some decision making. Uh, abilities um, to how to drive services. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that there yet. I'm hoping that with the Crespi work we can get there. Um, that we can. Um, that's not my area of expertise on how to build governance structures within community, but I, I think that's definitely an area we need to to go to in right. our vision. Uh, and then final thing for now, um, Bob D. Bernardis was the person assigned in the previous administration to helping to access space and actually had a contract with the county um, and was in a unique position to be able to connect dots and I think was successful in many regards. I'm not sure how this administration is planning on or if they are planning on carrying on that work, um, but to my colleague's point, Councilmember Glass, um, there are a number of organizations who are trying to seek more appropriate space across the entire county and yet we have literally millions of vacant office space uh, across the entire county. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to more intentionally connect to our friends in the development community and from a holistic approach um, by leveraging resources and having economies of scale, I think it, it is in our residents' best interest for the county to take a leading role and to help connect that and help to coordinate those dots for you guys. So. Um, that's something I'd like to explore later on down the line because I think it could help raise all boats. And then also on the transportation component, regardless of whether you're a large, medium, or small nonprofit, everybody has the same issue. Um, and so that's another area uh, that I think we can lead uh, to raise all boats. And we even looked at one point at developing a circulator bus that's specific to youth in the East County region to be able to connect to the program services, libraries, recreation centers, and schools. Um, weren't able to quite get it off the ground, but it is something that I'd like to explore. And Germantown's another area that would really benefit from something like that because the lack of public transit options. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And then it could also be a workforce development piece. Mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Great. Got all of our ducks in order. All right, well, uh, no more lights, so we wanna thank you both for coming out for this great presentation. Uh, wanna come out and visit the program at some point, so we'll schedule a time to come out, which would be great, and thank you for coming today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.